Please welcome our final panel of the conference, How Lawmakers Can Still Find Common Legislative Ground in Polarized Times, with United States Senator Joe Manchin, Democrat of West Virginia, who recently helped launch the organization Americans Together, and former United States Senator Rob Portman of Ohio. This conversation will be moderated by CNN Chief Cor Congressional Correspondent, the pride of Darien, Illinois, Wisconsin Badger forever, my friend, Manu Raju. I like your walk on. Yeah, well, it's great to be here. <laughs> it's great to, uh, and it's, it's also, you know, as, as Jen was saying, I am a Chicago area native, so I grew up in the western suburbs, Darien, Illinois, and uh, oh, there's someone from knows Darien, that's great, uh, maybe he's from there, um, and a diehard Cubs and Bears fan, so um, in fact, if you watch uh, Inside Politics Sunday, this Sunday, 7 a.m. Central, 10 a.m. Central as well, airs twice, uh, there'll be an interview with Jim McMahon, the uh, 85 Bears quarterback, as you all probably know, he was up on Capitol Hill lobbying about something important to him, so I hope you'll watch that. And I'll also interview these two fine also, senators. Also Rands. <laughs> yeah, that's right, to my left. Um, and uh, who will hope to have a great discussion today and continue the discussion afterwards as well. Um, so, um, I, you know, I want to start off by talking about, obviously, um, you know, we're going to talk about the try to diagnose the problems uh, in Washington and um, why, you know, in some quarters, bipartisanship and compromise can be dirty words. And, and, and talk about what their deal making has been like, uh, especially in the last Congress. So uh, I first want to um, uh, start off about the problems. So, Senator Portman, here's an easy one uh, Is Congress broken? Yes. <laughs> there you go. Yes, end, of, end of conference. <laughs> well, look, I think what we're going to talk about today, I hope, is uh, why it is not broken if you have members who have the right attitude, which is that they're getting elected to get things done. So to make a difference, not just make a point. And if you have that attitude and you're really trying to figure out how to get to yes, by the way, whether you're on the right or on the left, whether you're MAGA or whether you're progressive, you can still have that attitude of trying to serve your constituents. And in the case of the Senate, you know, make your state better, make your country better. So I think you can still do it. And the proof of it is that Joe and I did a lot of that together. We were joking earlier, every bipartisan effort we seemed to be together on when I was there, um, and we got a lot done. So I think you can, even in the dysfunction, which is clear yeah. in, in Congress, uh, you know, work your way through it. It's not easy. It's harder than it used to be. Having done it for 30 years off and on, uh, it's harder, yeah. but it can be done. And we'll get into some of those bipartisan deals a little bit later on in the discussion. Senator Manchin, you famously said uh, a few years ago, quote, this place sucks. Uh, <laughs> and he's not talking about the University of Chicago, an esteemed institution, of course, the United States Senate. Do you well, still feel this way? <clears throat> well, I expect a lot more. You know, I think, first of all, the attitude you have to come with with any type of compromise position in a democracy means that we have to make it work, represent a form of government that we have in, a, in the republic that we all own. So I've always said, I've never met the first person that's always right, but I've never met the first person that's always wrong. Now, I've walked away from a person I thought was always wrong because I didn't take enough time to get something productive. So it's my fault. Once you come to that in your mind, that this person's got something to offer, okay? And together, we're gonna work it out. The biggest problem is nobody knows anybody. There's not enough time. We get there on a Monday evening. We leave on a Thursday at noon. And there's nothing in between that we do anything in a collaborative way. We have to really work it getting to know each other. You got to really want to like somebody. You got to really want to know what they're about. Spend a little bit of time. And those of us, Heidi sitting here, those of us who did that, we just were attracted to each other because of our personalities, but we liked each other. We didn't look at Rob as an R and I don't think he looked at me as a D. We just want to get something done, mm -hmm. period. And from that standpoint, the place sucks because there's not enough people that are having or spending enough time or making enough of an effort to get stuff done. Hmm. I mean, do, how much is the, are the relationships uh, a part of this, Senator Portman? Because Senator Manchin raises a point that I hear a lot too, that, look, this was different. Uh, the senators used to, in, in a different yeah. era, stay, live, live in Washington. They had their house in Washington. Then you've seen, now you see those members who moved to Washington get criticized for being creatures of Washington. Is that part of the problem here? 
It's part of the problem, but again, you can overcome those problems. Um, and Joe and I used to do that sometimes on a boat that was in the Washington Harbor. Um, where he would invite, over some Coca-Cola. Yeah, over some Coca-Cola. <laughs> but Joe would invite Republicans and Democrats, and maybe an independent or two, uh, uh, and we would you know, have a nice time on the boat together and talk about family, talk about other things other than politics. But I think when I said earlier that the attitude is really important, I do think it's the most important thing, is that we change the way people think about politics, that when they get elected, they're actually getting elected to get something done for their constituents, not just to be performative, uh, as Heidi and I talked about at University of Cincinnati recently. You know, it's, it's, it's about actually accomplishing results. But second is, it doesn't work unless there's a certain level of trust. Yeah. Yeah. And that level of trust is, is about relationships. And you know, it's watching somebody and making sure you, you, you see the integrity you need, you're able to trust that person to work with you, uh, but it's also trial and error. You know, we've worked with a lot of members, and you kind of know what members are in it for the right reasons, and you can, you can trust and work with. But this is an issue for our entire country. I think it was talked about earlier in some of the, the seminars here today, which is how do you raise that level of trust in our institutions? In Congress, it kind of has to start with how do you raise that level of trust between members? Mm. So you do, as Joe just said, look at each other as individuals and not as partisans. Let me add to this so you'll know the environment. We, Rob and I and Heidi, we'd, we'd go to work every morning in a hostile working environment. And I mean that literally, a hostile working environment. That means we're going to work every day and your fellow co-workers trying to get you fired. <laughs> and, that, and that's supposed to be acceptable. Now, when you talked about we used to live, people, and David would know way back when, they used to live there, their kids went to school together, they were in PTAs together, they basically went to sporting events, they knew each other, okay? And there was an unwritten rule. You never campaigned against a setting colleague. You just didn't do it. You didn't go out and encourage someone to run against one of your friends. You didn't give money to somebody running against one of your friends. But now, since I've been there in 2010, Rob was there before me, Heidi and I came in about the same time. But what happened is, every, if Rob is up, he has an R by his name, I have a D by my name. When Rob is up, in his cycle he's up, with a two-year cycle, that's a two-year cycle, He's up. I'm expected, first of all, never sign on to a piece of legislation as a co-sponsor that might be something popular and good because he might get credit. And we've got to do everything we can to make sure Rob doesn't get credit so he can't get reelected. And they want me basically to campaign against him and give money. If Donald Duck's running against him and has a D <laughs> by his name, I'm supposed to give $5,000 for my PAC to help defeat my friend. When I first got there, I told Harry Reid, I said, Harry, I come from a little town in West Virginia, a little coal mining town. And if you act like this back home, they're going to take you out and beat the crap out of you. <laughs> I'm not going to do it. So I have never campaigned against a setting colleague. I've never given money to another person running against a setting colleague. If whoever you send me from Ohio, I'm going to work with or whatever part of the country. We've lost that. And I've tried to get an ethic bill passed. I says, well, since we can't govern ourselves, maybe we need an ethics violation, an ethics bill with a violation. If we do this and break that, then you can use it in the campaign against us. Something to kind of hold us in checks and balances. I think there's a, there's a reason why that bill has never been voted on. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Vote, I can barely get anybody to sign it. Yeah, exactly. Maybe you're the only sponsor of it. I, in, in 2016, uh, Joe contacted me, and I was up for re-election in Ohio, and I was running against the guy who you knew, Ted Strickland. And Joe said, uh, I'll tell you what, Rob, I will come in and work for you or against you, whatever you think will help you most. <laughs> I said, just stay out. <laughs> but so, you did. You, but here, Ted Strickland hey, Ted, Ted yeah, is a friend of mine. Involved. We were governors together. We worked together. I like Ted. But I said, Ted, I can't do it. I will not do it. Rob's a friend of mine. He's my colleague. Whatever Ohio decides, that's, I'm fine. Maybe if he endorsed him in the Democratic primary, that would have hurt the, with the Democratic voters. Exactly. You're, you're exactly. exactly. But you were talking about the general election issue. But what about the primary Problems. I mean, the idea of compromise oh with, you know, especially you look, House districts are so gerrymandered and it's so catered to, uh, you know, whoever wins the primary is probably going to end up winning the general election. But, you know, Senate primaries are, are obviously very influential as well. How much is, is a primary politics dictating policy and making it difficult to cut deals? A lot, a lot. So it, it's a tough issue uh, to resolve. But the reality is fewer and fewer people are voting in primaries. How many of you vote in primaries? Please raise your hand. Wow. You're, that's pretty good. Okay, well, you're self-selected here by coming to this. 
But still, about half of you didn't raise your hand. I mean, people are not voting in primaries. And there's a stat out there that I'm probably going to misuse here, but something like 8% of the American people are electing half of the members of Congress. What does that mean? It means that in the primary, you might have 30% of Republicans or Democrats who show up, and the person who wins that primary in a red state or a blue state, or as Manu said, in a district which is increasingly either red or blue, partly because of redistricting and gerrymandering, partly because it's how our country is today. In other words, it's more divided than ever, so a rural state will be redder and redder and redder. Take West Virginia, an urban state bluer and bluer and bluer. So think about it. You got 20 to 30 percent of the people who are in that party who are voting in that primary and electing somebody who will go on to win the general election unless some miracle occurs. How about all those independent voters and all those voters from the other party, in addition to the voters of the, say, the Republican Party who didn't vote, that's where you get the 8% figure. Only about 8% of the people then are deciding who the next member is. So that's the extent of the problem. And what happens is, as Manu rightly says, is during a primary, you know, you're out there fighting for who can go furthest to the left or who can go furthest to the right, and you take certain positions. And, and again, that attitude of fixing problems is sort of overtaken by that attitude of, I'm going to go there and fight against the bad guys. Republicans fighting against Democrats, Democrats fighting against Republicans. So it's a problem. Yeah. It's not well, easily solved, but the most important thing to me, vote in primaries. If you're an independent, vote in primaries. Everybody should get involved in the primary system. And there are some systems, you know, in Alaska, Maine, and elsewhere that I think are, are hopeful, uh, but I'm not sure they're the right answer for every, every state, uh, you know, that provide ranked choice voting or California open primary. So there, there, there are systems look, they are looking at this, and our little center in Cincinnati is looking at it as well. well so, I, I, before, I, before you jump in, I mean, this is your primary issues. You know, you had considered running for president at one point, but you could never do it in the Democratic, for the Democratic nomination, because the, the, you couldn't win a Democratic primary. Well, the prim here, let me, let me just, if you want to know what the, the problem is, when you have a person with the storied name of Kennedy, whether you like him, don't like him, whatever you think about Robert F. Kennedy Jr., that can't even participate in the Democratic primary when he has the lineage of a president, the most famous president, and John F. Kennedy, and that name he can't even participate, thinks it's basically passed. That tells you everything. It's a duopoly. You're, doing, you're dealing with businesses. You're not dealing with ideologists or anybody basically in Washington trying to do what's best for the country. They're a business model. They're making billions and billions of dollars if you belong to the Democrat business model or the Republican business model. That's what we're dealing with today. So you need open primaries. You need some way, uh, uh, we call it ranked choice or majority voting. You know, you need to have a primary where a person that doesn't have the political backing or the finances can compete. Mm -hmm. If that person can't compete with the best ideas, the best attitude, the best purpose of why they're serving, putting them, uh, their country before themselves, but they don't, they don't line up properly with the party or the business model, they can't, can't really participate. My daughter's here with me today, Heather, and we just launched today. It's a, it's a website. I'd love for you all, if you're interested in politics, it's called americanstogether.com. It's pretty simple, americanstogether.com. Go and look, and it'll show you exactly what your state has to offer or why you think you're confined. It'll show you the district you might live in for, for a district that might be a, uh, a House member, and it's going to show you how it's gerrymandered. And they're horrible. Democrats and Republican districts have been gerrymandered to where it basically discourages anybody. Why in the world are you, am I in that district when most of the people are down here, but they had to make sure to make sure this person lived here, and it's a Democrat or Republican, they had to be in a certain district. This is all cooked. It's all cooked. And when Rob told you, there'll be 150 or 160 million of us that will vote in a general election. But basically, we've let less than 20 million, 10 million on each side, decide who our presidential candidates are going to be. So you have a very small percentage giving, serving up to us what options we're going to have. And that's why you have people discouraged with the system. Some people stay home. Some people get more encouraged, more enraged with the whole system. I just want to follow up because you brought up Rob, RFK Jr. Do you think it was a mistake for him to run as an independent? I, I never, I, I, I swear to goodness, I would never think it's a mistake for anybody to run for any office. I think public service is still... But it could help Trump, Trump and you don't want Trump. The noblest of all professions. I, I don't care where you're coming from, what you're thinking. You put yourself forward. If you will even put yourself forward, I had to make a conscientious decision that I didn't see a pathway. I, I'm not going to be involved to make a statement. I'm going to be involved to win. Okay. And if I'm going to get involved, I want to see if there's a pathway. I didn't see that, and I didn't feel comfortable with it. And I thought it could have been a deterrent to where it could have made a decision that there wasn't uh, something I wanted to be. 
uh, known as a spoiler. That, and I don't really know. Is Robert Kennedy going to help Donald Trump or help Joe Biden? Is it going to hurt Donald Trump? or I can't tell you. Usually it was kind of, you know, I can tell you that Ross Perot uh, got Bill Clinton elected. I think that's pretty uh, well documented. And uh, so there's been some changes. And we know that there's been some changes in when Hillary Clinton was running in 2016 that, you know, the third party that made a difference. Mm -hmm. We're so divided and separated right now. I just would hope that everyone knows here. Don't become divided. You're not divided. Even though they want you to make you believe that it's just a divided country we live in, it's not. You want us to be united. 60% 60 of us live in what we call the sensible middle. You might be center right, center left. And the only thing about center right and center, you want the grand old party to be grand again. You want the Democratic Party to be compassionate and responsible again. You don't want the extremes basically jerking you back and says, well, you got nowhere to go. You either come here or you're out. Mm. And so you feel homeless and helpless. I, I want to turn to you know what the rural urban divide <laughs> that you know this conference is about, the bridging the divide, and, and talk about the issue of, of guns. Um, you know because you guys worked on the bipartisan uh, Safer Communities Act last Congress, it became law. One of the issues that was not dealt with here was what, what to do about some semi-automatic rifles. Why, why a lot of people, particularly in urban settings, would wonder why has Congress not banned AR-15s. Senator Portman, do you think, is that pure partisanship or is it the, a regional divide that explains that? Well, it's certainly a regional divide. I mean, if you go to the rural areas of Ohio or West Virginia, uh, you'll have some very strong views on that. And, and you know, people um, want to keep their weapons that they have and, and they view them as, you know, appropriate because they're responsible gun owners and they have very, very strong views on it. Um, so, yeah, it's, um, and they vote on that basis. Mm -hmm. So in their hierarchy of votes, uh, of issues that count, that would be at the top for, for a lot of people in the rural areas. And so, you were in that room, so why was it not part of that discussion when you guys cut that deal? It was part of the discussion. Um, I think at the end of the day, we decided not to include it. One, because it didn't have uh, much political support, part of it for the reasons I said, because it's, uh, it's taking something away from people. But second, I think the data that we had as to the ban last time it was in effect um, was, was not convincing one way or the other. In other words, it showed that um, it didn't make a, a, a major impact on, on crime. Mm -hmm. Now, there's other data out that you know, showed yes, some showed, showed no, but I think there was not a consensus in the room that it was going to make a big difference. Uh, but that was gun safety legislation that was um, by the media, um, except for CNN and Manu. Um, <laughs> you know, was, was viewed as dead on arrival. They said, we just couldn't do it, and we did it. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it was Chris Murphy, who's, you know, no moderate. I mean, he's a real liberal. And then uh, John Cornyn, who's no moderate, he's a real conservative. And a bunch of us got together and said, you know, this is, this is common sense gun safety legislation. Let's, let's get something done here. I mean, and you, well, let, go ahead. Let me just say, in West Virginia, uh, and I mean this in, in the most uh, positive way, in, in our state, if, if you're a responsible person, you come to our state. If you don't have a gun, we'll give you one. <laughs> and I, I, you had to hear what I said first, if you're a most responsible person. Responsibility is the most important thing in teaching how. So when we did the Mansion Toomey Bill back in 2013, it was based around responsible gun ownership. You know, uh, it's called gun sense where I come from. There's certain gun sense. You don't loan your gun to a stranger. Uh, you don't uh, basically... Uh, you're, you're taught at a very young age how to handle it, the respect of that gun. You don't even give your gun to a family member that's not responsible. You're very, very protective of this, of this weapon, if you will, whether it be for self-defense, for hunting, for purposes of feeding yourself, or for the pleasure of it. So when you say you're going to ban something, and I, I'll never forget when uh, the debate came in 2013, they said, uh, there was one of my senators uh, came to me from a state that's not truly a gun-related state, and says, I just can't figure out why you all do this. Why don't you just ban all this? And I says, well, let me ask you something. I looked in your beautiful car out there, and it has 140 on a speedometer. Why don't we just ban your car? Why would you buy the car with 140 miles per hour on a speed? You can't go 140. Mm. That's illegal. Why would you do it? But you have a choice to vote and buy it. But you're responsible. So I said, in 1934, you remember if you've watched the old gangster movie with the Tommy guns, the big machine guns, they shoot everybody? They were outlawed in 1934. They weren't outlawed. They were never banned. You can still buy one. You're going to pay one heck of a price for it. And we've never had a mass shooting with a Tommy gun, with a machine gun open. 
So what we can do is if you're going to basically say, this is, the type of per this is the type of weapon that only certain people should be able to have. And you're going to pay a fine for, or a fee for it, a high fee, maybe a couple, two, three, four thousand dollars to have a right to buy. You're going to have to take continuing education to show that you have the responsibility and the aptitude to do it. Those are the ways we should be approaching this if you really want to do it in a real way that's responsible. And so when you tell me, you're going to say, oh, no, Joe, you can't buy that. Oh, what the hell? Why can you buy what you want to buy? And I can't buy what I want to buy. That's the pushback you get. I'm talking to you from a gun state. People that really, truly protect and really want their guns. But these are gun, law-abiding gun owners. They don't want the criminals to get them because it gives them a bad connotation. And then, so they're fighting with us. And they says, just shut some of this stuff to the point. Make us responsible and let us show you we're responsible. I can have an AR-15. I like to sports shoot. You don't go out hunting Bambi with an AR-15. I've never done that. But, you know, they want to make you think that. So we have to take a different approach. The approach we're using right now, ban it or don't do anything because we can't pass it, is not working. Mm. Education, paying the, for the privilege to have it, showing you have the ability and the responsibility to do it, and go through continuing education. And, and of course, the mansion to me bill would have expanded background checks on commercial gun sales just yesterday. I've got to tell you one cute thing about the mansion to me bill. We got Jeff Flake. Our dear friend, Jeff Flake, Republican from, uh, uh, from Arizona. Now ambassador to Turkey. And, uh, Jeff, Jeff Flake, basically, we were doing something about trying to stop on, uh, through internet sales. And Jeff says, Joe, I'm, I'm a Mormon. I got 200 cousins. That's how we communicate with each other. <laughs> we had to put the Mormon exception in for Jeff, <laughs> that he, his family with the internet because he had so many cousins. <laughs> That's a, that could be an anecdote in a book somewhere. Maybe your book. I mean, uh, we'll see. Uh, but just yesterday, the president actually took executive action on Very to expand good. background checks. Are you comfortable with that? Very I mean, good. Avoid, ignoring was, Congress? The way I've read it right now, we're going through it with a fine tooth comb. I told them when they were doing this, and I talked to uh, uh, Dattleman uh, with the uh, DEA, DEA uh, and we were talking. I said, Steve, the most important thing you have to understand. As a person who has a gun that might want to give it to my son because I know he's responsible, I've told him how to use it, don't deny me that. Don't make me have to be a dealer in order to have, even be able to transfer it. So we took care of friend, our friends, people that we know responsible, and our family. We made sure all that. We're going through the bill right now, but I think it was a very needed step that needs to be taken because we know an awful lot of illicit. What we're talking about gun shows, you can go to a gun show right now. I can go in. You can be an FFL dealer. You can be a licensed dealer, and if you do, you can't let me have that gun unless there's a background check, okay? But I can be on a table next and pay $150 or $200 to get a table and rent it, and I can have 100 guns there and sell them without because I don't have to. That's the gun show loophole. Mm. This is closing that, and it should. If you have any gun sense and you're responsible, you want to know that's how we're taught. I don't know that person. I'm not going to sell it to that person. But that's what the background checks are for, and we do a background check very quickly, and it has to be done within a certain yeah. amount of how, how do you feel about that executive action? Well, I don't know enough about the details, but I'm told um, that it is authorized through the gun safety legislation mm -hmm. that Joe and I same thing you were doing that you Joe and I worked on. on. Yeah. I'm not sure that that's going to stand up in court, <laughs> um, but I'm not sure that the administration cares much about that. I think they wanted to get it, you know, get it out there, and, and um, it's so such common sense. So we'll see. But if it doesn't pass, probably uh, depending on what happens in the Congress and the House and the Senate and the presidency next go around, probably would have a better chance of you know, being looked at legislatively if it, if it gets knocked out um, within the parameters that Joe talked about. Mm -hmm. So a lot of people think you know, that there are, are not background checks. There are. Um, and this is a, a you know, relatively 90%. small exception. Yeah. So, and, and background checks are, I think, relatively acceptable now mm -hmm. nationwide. Okay. Um, you know, we, we, as we, as we started talking about last Congress, let's talk quickly about this Congress, um, it has not been very not, not much to talk about. No, exactly. <laughs> and why, what explains the dysfunction, to put it lightly, the chaos? Uh, why has this Congress been so historically unproductive? I, I can, I mean, sitting inside watching it, and Rob, I said, he, he, live, he left on the highest note of all, the 117th Congress, will go down as one of the most productive Congresses in modern day history of what we were accomplishing. And we did it because we had a 50-50. Who are you going to blame, the Republicans or the Democrats? We're both at fault, and we both can take credit for doing something. So it would be equal. One side didn't do it without the other. 
And I think we took that approach and really took an opportunity to take, take charge and make some things happen. And in the last, well, Tips since Act, history. Electoral yeah. reform, the infrastructure bill, um, there was a lot done. And, and, but, and the last, well, every two years, Congress. So we're in the 118th Congress, which goes for two years. And then you have the 119th will come after the 2024 20, election. About five, the average is about 500 to 520 bills are usually passed within that period of time. And that's pretty much on track every Congress. Guess where we are now? 69 bills. 69 bills. This will go down as the absolute worst performing Congress in the history of the United States of America. And it's because, and I'm not saying because of one party or the other, but the Republicans have the majority in the House. And it's like watching a Major League Baseball game that's going in extra inning, and you're wondering who the next relief pitcher is going to be. <laughs> that's really. Who's going to be the speaker? Who? I don't know. You do one thing, I'm going to throw you out and get somebody else. So they, they just can't. They're, they've tied themselves in a knot. And these are all good people that I can work with. I know them all, and Rob knows them all, and we shouldn't be in that, but they are. Okay. And I said... Uh, they're just not, we just got to get out of their, they got to get out of their own way. Senator Portman, you're a former it. House member, so why is this House Republican majority devolved the way this it has? <laughs> I want to hear this one. <laughs> a lot of it's about numbers, as, as, as Joe said, but, you know, to back up for a second, this notion that we're not going to try to find common ground, we're still going to play politics and uh, performative politics, um, that has taken hold. And so in the House, you think about it, Eight members of the Republican Party uh, were all that was needed to vacate the, the uh, speakership. Eight members, that's 3.9% of the caucus. By the way, that 3.9% of the caucus, they were all on Meet the Press, Face the Nation, This Week, my news show. <laughs> I mean, what's not to like about Back. this? If you're Don't blocking... <laughs> You know, Republican. They are speaker, making news. They are. Which, you oh, know, here we go. That, now yeah. we're back to the business model. By the way, now we're back to for the business model. Yes, it's weeks, our fault. No it's speaker. Our fault. So, so part of my blame <laughs> goes to the media, not to my new, but but to seriously that there's no accountability. It's like if you do this, if you don't focus on results and moving the country forward, you get rewards. And one of the rewards is is media. Like most of these members have never been on Meet the Press. This is like well, this, this is pretty good. I like this. Fundraising. Fundraising is increasingly done online. That's so exactly. in the old days, you could say it wasn't perfect, but people generally relied on donors who were major donors, maybe you can give 500, 1,000 bucks. Now they go online and Joe did it, I did it, 30 bucks, 50 bucks, 70 bucks, you know, several times. And members are raising tens of millions of dollars a quarter online. But how do they do it? They do it by throwing out the red meat. When I thought about running again, my team came to me and said, you know, your emails, like, they're terrible, okay? <laughs> they're about policy. Nobody cares. You gotta go after it. You gotta go to the other side. And I said, I'm not, I'm not gonna do that. You know, I always edit these wonderful emails that they'd send me because they were just full of, you know, attacks. But that's what raises money. And so, what's not to like about this? You're raising lots of money. You're on Meet the Press. You're winning your primaries, we talked about earlier, because all you need to worry about is getting your people to show up in the primary in your red district or your red state. And that's what we need to change, is that whole incentive structure and create an incentive to actually be rewarded for doing stuff. The border would be probably the poster child of this. Mm. We have talked about the friggin' border for 30, awful, 40 awful, years. Awful, awful. I mean, since the 1980s, 86, I think, was the last time a major immigration and border bill was passed. It's good politics, right? But it's terrible for the country. It's terrible for the fentanyl flooding into West Virginia and Ohio. It's terrible for what's happening on our border with not knowing who's in our country. I mean, we've got to fix it. But the political system is not attuned to that. Instead, it's attuned to people on the right and the left saying, this works pretty well for me. So I don't know. That, that, that's, that's the bigger issue. In terms of the House specifically, I think Joe's right. I think it's the numbers. I mean, you've got the most narrow majority you've had, um, certainly in the last couple of centuries. Well, we never heard even, about even vacate, worse. vacating on the Democrat side. No one ever thought of vacating going after the, OK? Yeah. Well, you had a few extra votes, though. <laughs> but it's, it's I mean, literally, you all took it to another level. Where Speaker Johnson's got one vote. Like, yeah. one vote can take him down. Yeah. Well, votes. you know what? Because you know why? I'm going to tell you exactly why. Dennis Hastert comes in. Dennis Hastert comes in, he has a pure role. He has the Hastert role. Has to be, right. we don't pass anything unless we have all Republicans. 218. Majority that of the means majority. The majority voted. The Republicans, it's a Republican bill. And then the Democrats stayed right in sync with that, and that's ridiculous. There's no such thing as a joint. 
And, and right now he could put, he, he, there's, you cannot tell me he can't find 10 or 20 Repub Democrats that will work with him and not ask for the whole enchilada, if you will. All they want is a little bit of participation in a body that usually basically majority rules and they yeah. can care less about the other side. The joint operation doesn't hurt there at all. And Democrats are going to have to understand that's going to how they're going to have to govern when they get back in, too, because it's going to be so, so narrow, and if they don't come to that. But I, I want to just ask, follow up on the, on the border, because yeah. there was a bipartisan border security deal, and it was killed by Republicans I, and the former president. I, mean, I, I was on the floor yesterday. I had to give a speech, and they were talking about Mayorkas, Ali Mayorkas, and uh, wanting to impeach Ali Mayorkas. And then my Republican friends, and these are people I have all the respect for in the world, but they're on a, they've got, you know how you get your marching orders? Mm -hmm. uh, I don't folks, remember that. I, I remember, yeah, <laughs> you never took them very well, and I don't take them at all. Anyway, what happens is, <laughs> what happens is, is they were, they were talking and talking and talking about Mayorkas, we should be doing this. He did, I says, wait a minute, we all have a boss. If you don't like what Mayorkas is doing, he hasn't done anything criminal, there's no grounds for impeachment high crimes and misdemeanors, there's nothing there. They've gone through all that. Now it's just basically a popularity type thing to keep that in, in the limelight on the front page. So I'm sitting, I couldn't take it anymore. I'm gonna give a speech on something else. And I said, before I go to my other subject, I'd like to have the permission to speak on this. And I said, listen, the bottom line is, this man has done a job. This man is, okay, and if you wanna blame the border, the border problem is basically Biden cr created that in 20, when he came in in 2020. He did that from a compassion standpoint, but he made a big mistake. He thought, well, the pandemic, we have to let more people in. Let's give more people a better chance for a better life. I understand where he was coming from. It didn't work, okay? He never thought we got overrun the way we did, and he didn't shut it down, okay? Now, with that being said, okay, they put together, the Republicans put James Langford. Who would have ever thought James Langford would have yeah. come to a deal? Uh, the most beautiful person I can think of, the most moral straightforward person that you ever want to be, but he's extremely, extremely conservative. And James is the type of person that he, it, it's got to be better. It can, it's got to be better. And I said, James, the Constitution says a more perfect union. We're not perfect. We're getting better. We don't score a touchdown every time we get the ball. <coughs> a couple first downs don't hurt, okay? So we go into all of this, and we're talking and everything. And, but he made a deal. I says, oh, my God, James made a deal. We got one hell of a deal now. And my Republican friends in October of last year, after October 7th, the Israeli, the Hamas attack on Israel, they said, we are not going to do any type of aid for Ukraine or any other aid until we take care of our own borders. I agreed. I agree with my Republican colleagues as a Democrat. They're right. So we go at it. We're going to get it done. Everybody's working and everybody's, and James is working hard. And I keep saying, James, asylum's crazy. We've never done asylum at the border. We've never done. He said, I know, Joe, we got to get it all fixed. I said, okay. He goes through all that. He gets a bill. All my Republicans are for it. All my friends, all your friends, they're all for it. Up until Donald Trump says, ah, I don't think it's very good. I think it'd be better. I don't think you should do this. This is bad. Let's just wait until I get in. I'm thinking, Joe Biden was wrong, but now Joe Biden has at least tried to fix it. He come to, to come to the table and says, okay, let's do a bipartisan bill. Now, politics has really raised this ugly head, okay? And now we can't. And we're sitting there with the most dangerous situation I think they've ever faced in my country that I've been in since my modern times. I can remember being involved in observing what's going on. I'm more concerned about our border today than I've ever been. I'm more concerned about our country than I've ever been. And we can fix it, and it's not going to be fixed because this might not be a political agenda for any one person or party. It's not right. Not right at all. The, the one addition I would make to what Joe said. Do you, do you agree with that? that I agree with that, yeah. But I would go further. Thank you. Uh, and this is, you know, this is me being out of office, so I, I can talk. Like oh, yeah. Uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm coming unplugged. quick. I'm, <laughs> let her rip, brother. Let her rip. Well, you think this is bad. Just wait till he gets out. Um, so it's not just that it wasn't perfect. It was an attitude by a lot of Republicans that they would rather do it themselves next year when we have the majority and when President Trump is reelected. Um, and therefore, why would we do it now? That, to me, is exactly the wrong attitude yeah. in terms of how you ought to approach your job. It goes back to what we said at the very beginning. If your attitude is get as much done as you can for your constituents in the time that you're honored to, and privileged to serve, you get it done, even incrementally, whatever you can get done. And, and that's what I tried to do in the House and in the Senate. And you know, I got criticized sometimes for working across the aisle, but mostly people, because most people agree with that. Like They want you to get 
stuff done for themselves and their family. Get stuff yeah, done. Shh, stuff done. <laughs> Look Come at on, this is not a PG it. audience. Yeah. You know, rip, together, we don't. Don't, don't forget, you'll say it back. Yeah, shh, stuff done. <laughs> stuff done. So it, it's more than just they were saying, as Joe said, this isn't perfect. Uh, they were saying, we want to wait and do it our way. Oh, it's now, here's the other part of this. If, in fact, President Trump is reelected, if, in fact, there is a Republican majority in the Senate, the House is going to be very narrowly divided. It's going to be impossible, in my view, to get immigration reform done. So this was an opportunity. Was it perfect? No. Was it helpful? Yes. And specifically with regard to asylum policy, because that's really what's driving a lot of this. That's the pull factor. People are being told by traffickers, you come to the United States, you cross the border, you get asylum, you get six or seven years before your hearing, you know, you can send your kids to school, you can go to work. And the traffickers are right. Like, the smugglers are right. Uh, they're evil people, but they're smart. And so if you don't fix that system... We have to change the rules tough. of asylum. It's asylum says you get one foot on our... Well, that's been changed, and we can change it again to basically you have to show from the state, from the uh, country you come from uh, that basically there was a need, that you had to threaten your life, that your family was been discriminated. Fear You yeah. have to show... They don't have to do any of that now. Mm. Well, basically, we have to prove it later, and what happens, they can't, they can't adjudicate everybody at the border. There's just too many coming. So that's what, that was you remember the, the five, you heard the word 5,000, the number, which the Republicans just beat the living craps out of James Langford, and James which Langford. Which is the threshold for the threshold. migrants so you know what, entering I, I said, the James, why did US. you put the 5,000 in? Why the number, James? He said, Joe, you remember when we were talking, and we said, if we, how many can we adjudicate a day? The maximum, what could we ever adjudicate a day before we shut everything down? You've overloaded us. Hmm. It was 5,000. So he was being up front saying, when, when you hit that threshold, you've maxed us out. We it, can't take anybody. It who, doesn't mean that 5,000 people were coming in. They weren't really. coming they in. Were that means we were keeping them there until we could adjudicate to see if they met. Now, so you'll know. They, but than, but they lost, the problem is that they lost the narrative. They lost the narrative of that, and they let that go out there, and Trump jumped all over it and killed him with it. But there's only about 10%, less than 10% of the people that come for asylum legally try to come, even qualify. Okay. So out of the 5,000, less than 500 would even qualify. What you never want to do, all of you all, you never want to see us shut down legal immigration. If we do, our country's done. If you can't have the people coming for the right reason and the ability to get here, we're Thank done. Um, I want to um, I want to hit a, a few other quick topics before we open it up to audience uh, questions here. Uh, one of the things that you guys were able to do in the last Congress was infrastructure. This has been something that's been very difficult to get done. Mm -hmm. And people will say, why, is, why was it so hard to get, well, you know, what, what is it that was making it, made it so difficult? Senator Portman, you cut that deal, and the former president came out and tried to kill it, and Republicans in the House tried to kill it. Why, when you look back at it, why, what, why did it, were they doing that just to deny Biden a victory? Or, or what's your assessment of what happened? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Unplugged poor. Uh, no, it was, it, was, it was two things. It was, uh, it was one, legitimate concerns about what was the substance of, of the legislation. I understand that. It's a very complicated bill, $500 billion plus. Um, you know, the first infrastructure bill really since the interstate highway system. Yeah. This was a big, big deal. Every president, five administrations had talked about it. Remember Infrastructure Week, you know, every year. Yeah. And, uh, why was, was, why was that, it so? That, that, bill, that I, bill had $100 billion of energy that we did in it, too. Great, great energy stuff in there. Explain and, why it was so hard to, to get to a point where people say, everyone believes in infrastructure, but why, is, why was it so hard in, to get to this achievement? Well, I would, I would approach it differently. I would say, why miraculously was it able to get done? Because it was a very substantial bill and not just a lot of money, but a lot of complications. Was, was there eight or ten of us? Well, it started off with five and five. Yeah, five was, and five. Was, That's exactly. Was, we had five Ds and five Rs. And four Democrats and me and, and four Republicans. It ended up 21 and 21. So we kind of, it was like from the middle out. Through, yeah. But we, we, I think it goes back to what we said earlier. One, it was a matter of establishing trust. We all trusted each other and knew each other, and we could say things behind closed doors we knew wasn't going to get repeated. Um, second was this idea of, you know, we were willing to take some risk to get to a solution, meaning compromise. You know, you've got to be willing to find that common ground on any individual issue. So, you know, ports, uh, transit, um, the digital infrastructure, because remember all the, all the high-speed broadband was, was, was in there. Uh, a lot of interesting and complicated issues, energy issues uh, that Joe brought to the table. So there was a lot in there, and we were able to work it, I would say, a dozen times. 
we were told it was dead on arrival. Mm -hmm. You remember that? Oh, yeah. You never said it, but your colleagues <laughs> did. Because it was complicated and hard. So usually, I, I would usually, flip the usually, question around. Usually say, bet against Congress. So yeah. that's, you know, the safe bet is to bet that the deal will not come together. But the reason we ever get it done was that level of trust, the dedication to finding common ground. And then, frankly, you have to work with the House. You have to work with the leadership. You have to work with the president. And I think we were wisely bringing the White House in early on. Today, President Biden goes around the country talking about his infrastructure bill. This is not his infrastructure bill. His was very different. But gave us a starting point, which was he had one that had very little. But he did have to sign it. He had to sign it in the end. So it's sort of ironic when I hear his infrastructure bill, because his was very different. His had a lot of social infrastructure, a lot of spending. And the core infrastructure, we kind of pulled out of that and took the significant tax increases out. But, but, but the reality is we never would have gotten it done had we not worked from the middle out yeah. and created just too much energy and enthusiasm for it. Joe also helped, and I'm, I'm, I'm going to say something. Uh, I can say it off the record now because there's nobody here who's going to read Oh, my. <laughs> but Joe worked with the Democratic leadership. Because remember, this was at a time when, although it was a 50-50 it was or 49-51. 50-50. 50-50. Yeah. But Chuck Schumer was the majority leader, and he determines what gets on the floor and what doesn't, right? So even though we had a lot of support for this, we were building support, putting pressure on, Joe helped us to get it on the floor for a vote. And that was critical. I had, to, I had to trade a vote to get a vote. What vote did you trade? See, I wouldn't even go into that. So you're going <laughs> to. Well, I'll be, honest, I'll be honest with you. I had to, uh, to, get, to get the infrastructure bill pulled, the infrastructure bill is part of BBB. Yeah. We pulled infrastructure out of Build BBB. Build Back Better bill. Build Back Better. I could never get there on Build Back Better. It was just so much, so much. But there's some good stuff here and there we should have been able to work on. And we were trying to pull that out. And it was a 50-50, so they needed my vote for the Democrats to get on a reconciliation of BBB, which I didn't want them to do. Which is that but right, I thought this for those who don't speak Senate, reconciliation allows the bill to be approved in a simple majority, but you guys were moving through a different process with infrastructure, right. which requires 60 votes. So, so I thought I had to make sure that Rob thought that we had enough bipartisan participation that if I had to make a deal, that we could put a bipartisan group together and get a privilege on the floor to get voted for. So they wanted to get on the bill so bad on BBB that I said, fine, give us infrastructure. If we do something bipartisan, we get privilege. If we have an agreement, we get a privilege to vote on it. And that's when it went to the House. And the House sat on it and fought back and forth and said that I lied to them uh, that I was going to vote for BBB. I said, I never, ever said I would vote for BBB. I couldn't vote for BBB. But I would vote to get on let you debate it. Mm -hmm. And they thought they could con convince me, coerce me or do anything else on top of that for eight months to vote for that bill, which I wouldn't. And then they held it hostage, and then we finally broke it. Oh, yeah. Uh, and that's, Rob, a, that's a good. But, but Rob had to, he had to bring the, the bipartisan. We knew the Democrat. He had to bring the Republicans. That would. I want to say one thing about Rob brought up a point when we were uh, debating that bill, because I really think we're all in a, we're in a mess right now as far as highway trust fund. The money's not going in. And there's more EVs we put out. There's nothing coming in. The EVs are using the same road, the same bridges. and every, If you have not an EV, you're using everything out there but not paying a penny for it. So Rob says, don't you think we ought to have a mileage, just a little bit of a mileage fee, something, if you have an EV, because you're paying. And if I'm buying a gallon of gasoline, I'm paying 18, 20 cents or whatever. And I said, God, Rob, that is so good. Let's do that. The White House beat the living crap out of us. <laughs> they says, "My God, we made a commitment. There's no one going to raise taxes if they make less than 400,000." Well, hell, most everybody that makes less than 400,000 has to drive a car. Everybody after 400,000 has somebody driving them. But well, they care. <laughs> <laughs> uh, before we get into audience questions, I do want to ask you about Remember Senator. There's Manchin. a book in that. <laughs> There's a book. There's a book in that. <laughs> Senator Manchin, you got. Uh, you, you mentioned the clashing with your party in the last Congress. No. You get, yes, there was a little bit of that. Um, and it was a large part because you refused to gut the Senate's filibuster rule. There was a 60 vote threshold. Yeah, they destroyed. wanted to, they uh, went, hold on, let me finish my question. Yeah, you, you can, you can jump in. That's... Um, and then, you know, uh, you know, they wanted you to allow for legislation to be approved on a simple majority basis. So I guess the question that a lot of people would have is that wouldn't it mean, you know, we're talking about issues on guns, on health care, on voting rights. So wouldn't it mean more for the priorities of your party if you gave in just a little bit on a Senate rule? Well, you saw what happened when they gave in a little bit, don't you? When Harry Reid in 2013 basically gave in a little bit and says, well, we're going to make sure that we get, uh, get the confirmation because Barack Obama was having an unrealistically hard time of putting his team together. And there's such a, such a thing as we call uh, will and pleasure. 
I was a governor, and I used to have to go to the state senate. And I said, this is my team. Well, we don't like that guy. We don't like that. I said, guys, listen, it's all about me. I've got to have a team together. And if I don't do well, throw me out. It's my fault. Now, if they do something criminally, then go get, go get them criminally. So the will and pleasure thing, I kept saying, that's what we've got to do. Harry says, no, no. I says, Harry, go over and sit down with, with Mitch McConnell and say, Mitch, listen, on people that come and go with the president, that's will and pleasure. They're not going to be here after the president's gone. They're coming and going with them. Let him have it, okay? That would be a 51-vote threshold. Make that deal Democrats and Republicans agree to, will and pleasure. Don't go into judges that are lifetime appointments. Don't even go close to anything that basically laws that we have to live by, our legislation. Mm -hmm. Don't touch any of that. When you start touching that, we become another rogue nation. We're going to be flipping like this. Every time you have a two-year change with a Senate or Congress, you're going to be switching your, they'll repeal something they didn't like. And I said, I will say this to all of you. I feel so strongly about the filibuster is the last Sebastian we have to hold this country together, any glue whatsoever, that I would recommend, if I'm asking anybody who wants to run for the Senate, will you defend the filibuster? If they said, no, I'll get rid of it. Well, fine, I'm not voting for you. I don't care if you're a Democrat, Republican, Independent, I'm not voting for you. There you go. All right. So, yeah, go let ahead. Me, let me put an mm -hmm. exclamation point on that because I couldn't agree with you more. When I was in the House, uh, I did a lot of bipartisan legislation. And often we would end up, uh, even when there was a Republican majority with legislation that maybe the majority of the majority wasn't supporting, but we could get the votes for it. And Republicans say, well, why are you, let's just do a strictly Republican bill. Let's just do one that can come out of the Rules Committee because the majority party controls the Rules Committee, has the supermajority, and just shoot it over to the Senate. And my answer always was, you know, we're trying to get something done here. We're actually trying to accomplish something. Like unfunded mandates reform was one of my first bills. Popular, bipartisan. Republicans said, why don't we just do a Republican version of this? Hmm. And I said, because the Senate filibuster. So it, it affects our entire democracy. In the tell, House, tell what, it's a them. simple majority. But in the Senate, you've got to get 60 votes. It means you've got to get some of the other party. So you can convince your colleagues in the House, guys, we've got to make some concessions here in order to get this actually to the president's desk and get it signed. Does that make sense to you? Mm -hmm. So that's one reason I think people don't realize how important the filibuster is for the whole system. It's not just about the Senate. It's about when you're putting together legislation in the House, you've got to think about how do you get through this 60-vote majority, which requires some buy-in from the other party, necessarily. No one's ever had 60 votes except for Barack Obama for about two years. Yeah, right. And uh, tell them what it, Donald Trump it, did to your party, his party, the Republican Party, every day when you had 54 Republicans, and he could not figure out why you couldn't pass what he wanted. He asked And us, in relationship with him and Mitch McConnell went from where to where. Yeah. Well, he well asked I don't us, know if it was just because of that, but yes. Yeah. He asked <laughs> us to get rid of the filibuster. From his point of view, think about it, we had Republicans, Republicans. If we didn't have the filibuster, he thought we could just run the tables and, and get stuff done. And some of us said, you know, that may be a short-term game, but it's a, it's a, it's a long-term loss. And what will happen is when the Democrats take control, which they will, and they did, and our parties are, you know, as divided as our country, right, so you're going to have back and forth, uh, then we'll, you know, they'll do their thing. We'll do our thing. And the other thing to think about here is we need more predictability in this right. country in terms of policy. And right. think about the border again. Stability. Once you get that border solution through, which I hope we will in the next Congress at least, then you want it to stay for a while, right? You don't want every two years for it to go back and forth, which could happen the way our narrow majorities are working, tax policy, health care policy, military policy. So you need to have some stability, and that's another reason that the filibuster works well. I want to I wanna get into this, this too. There are lots of questions here. So why don't we start here in the back? Hi there. My name is Garrett Simmons, and I hail from the College of uh, Wilmington in Ohio. All and, right. Uh, one question I'd like Come to... Come on, Ohio. Let's hear it from Ohio. <laughs> okay. I, I'd like to relate this a bit back to our last panel where um, someone mentioned that it appears like uh, Republicans have a monopoly on things like freedom and Democrats have a monopoly on things like diversity, but through conversation at this conference, we've been able to find out that's not the truth. So my question is, how do we talk to our lawmakers so that they can better reflect this attitude that we all seem to share? Well, I can tell you that's exactly what we're, you feel the same as we feel. Some of us are retiring or some people that have left and uh, that you feel kind of homeless and helpless. Why aren't they hearing what you're hearing. Why don't they come to the same conclusion you've come to? You follow me? We all, I said, people ask me what I am. I says, I'm fiscally responsible and socially compassionate. Put me wherever you want me. You want me on D side, you want me on R side, you want me on I side, makes no difference. 
I'm going to be what I think is right. And I've always said this, I've got to come home and face you. So if I'm in Ohio, as Rob, he'll come home, come home and talk to you. I go to West Virginia. If I can explain it, I can vote for it. If I can't explain it, I can't vote for it. You can't make wrong right. You can't make it just because of my political posturing. It might hurt me, and I've got to make it feel like, how do I tell you something that I don't want you to know I'm protecting my political rear end, okay? I'm not there to protect my, that's what, not what you sent me for. You didn't send me there to represent me. It's represent you. That's a democracy. And that's what we've got to get to. So what you're doing to now, ask people. You know the main thing to ask a politician? Why do you want the job? Ask them that question first. See how quick you get an answer. And, and you would be surprised how many people have a difficult time answering that. Uh, Very difficult time. I, I, I want to keep going because there are lots of questions here. Go ahead in the back. Great question. Thank you. And my name is Pranav Valetti. I'm from University of Wisconsin-Madison. Hey, Badger. All right. <laughs> <laughs> uh, just to clarify, this question does not have an angry tone. Just genuine, genuinely curious. It's yours. Um, <laughs> prefacing. A third of the 100 Congress members who reported financial transactions this year beat the S&P 500. Um, even if this is legal, it does harm the public's confidence of Congress. Um, and this conference is about finding common legislative grounds, but how can we find solutions to limit the common ground of financial information disparities and benefits that politicians seem to wield the vast majority of the public don't? And if this is misinformed, if you could provide more perspective on, on that, that would be helpful. Yeah, I, I don't know what the, what the numbers are. Um, you know, I, I, partly because I served in the administration, first Bush and second Bush administration, and I went through this ethics scrub where you gotta get rid of all your stocks and bonds, and uh, uh, I'm sorry, all, all of your stocks. You could do bonds and you could do mutual funds. So I always did that, and, and then the Senate passed a law saying you have to do that essentially, or you have to report it. Um, so some members, some more members did that. But I think that's the way to go. I think it's just, it's just better not to have the perception of some kind of, as you say, advanced warning on stock purchase, uh, you know, changes or, or information. And I think that, that's, that's the better policy. But it was a step in the right direction to say you at least have to report it, in my view, as and difficult as that is for, for some members. Um, but I think, you know, the vast majority of members of Congress are not spending their time playing the market. On the other hand, the perception is if members are invested directly in stocks, that that's an issue. If you're in a mutual fund, it's different. Or if you're, you know, invested in municipal bonds, it's different. And uh, anyway, that, that's, how, that's what I think the policy ought to be. I think, the, let me just say one thing to that. I think the easiest way to try, you know, people are coming in either at the front end of their career, they haven't made much money, or coming in at a moderate or middle or the end of it where they have already made their life savings, whatever. Look and see what they come in with because we have to have financial disclosures. Look at those disclosures and see how they have grown or diminished while they've been in office. That gives you a little bit of an idea. Are they capitalizing on their position? Is it more than normal growth would be in the stocks and bonds or whatever they had invested? Or basically, have they profited on knowledge they're receiving there? You can pretty much figure that and one out. And there have been some cases like that involving including uh, Congressman uh, Collins from New York that happened. Um, go ahead. They're watching the it pretty close. Hi, um, thank you but all three of you, Manu, Senators Manchin and Portman. My name is Hannah Ho. I'm a fourth year here at the University of Chicago. Originally from Rand, West Virginia. Hey, <laughs> oh, look at this. University of Rand, right? Yes, <laughs> went to Riverside High School. Um, so glad to see you on stage. Thank you. Um, I have a question regarding, um, it's a different type of background question. Um, I know we're talking about ga gun background checks. I have a question about political background party checks um, for entry, entering like politics in the office. Um, two summers ago, <coughs> I interned for Senator Capito um, from West Virginia. And I never got asked um, my political beliefs. Um, I had a different background of the party. She was conservative. And I was curious if you guys had, like, require, like, do you have a background check? Do you see harms um, asking that? Um, yeah, just wanted to hear your thoughts, like your staff, how diverse they are in the office. We, we screened all West Virginians. Uh, <laughs> other than that, I don't think we much. <laughs> That's awful. No, no That's seriously. Awful. Um, no, we never did. In fact, you know, I, I worked uh, as an intern. I mean, I worked, I was an intern in Congress way back in the day, and I didn't know whether I was an independent, uh, a Republican, a Democrat, or a vegetarian, or whatever. I mean, I was just, I was just like most students that I run into. You know, I was a sophomore in college who wanted to learn more about politics. I worked for a Republican, and I really liked him, and, and it ended up influencing my decision. But I think it's, 
it's a mistake to have any kind of a screen because you get different perspectives, and it's, it's good. I think uh, I have no idea what, what, I swear to goodness, I have no idea what my political affiliation of my, of my chief of staff is or any of my, I can, I can kind of figure, maybe assume, but I've never asked, and they never divulged. So that's good. But what I do, this, when we hire new people and they're bringing people in, I want to know a person that says, I don't want to go to work every day. Uh, and when I was in business, I didn't want to go to work every day and have to fight with my employees. That, hey, we're trying to do this. This is what our goals are today, and this is what we're trying to achieve. I want to make sure they understood where I was coming from. I said, you know a little bit about my politics. I'm kind of really in the middle here. I'm center left, center right. I, I look at a Republican as, as, as a friend as much as I do a Democrat. I look at whoever has a good idea, I'm going to take it and run with it. Uh, I'm a little bit more conservative on some issues, social issues, maybe than what most Democrats are. Uh, and I'm a little bit more flexible on some financial trying to help people get themselves up. So I said, if it doesn't fit into your politics, I don't want you to come to work and think you're coming for a paycheck. I want you to have an experience that you can go home and enjoy. And 99% of the people that come through my office for 14 years, that has been that type of cohesion. I get a few every now and then, and I can tell. It's just they're tearing at them. They don't want to tell me. But they're fighting every time I'm doing something that they really, that their heart's not into it. So I have to call them in. I says, listen, I want to help you because I can tell you you're not as satisfied as you should be, and it's not going to be a good experience. I think I have an office where I think I can help you get into that office that you're going to be much happier than you will with me. And I've had three or four of that happen. Hmm. And that's other than that, that we just, but I still don't, I assume that they, you know, they're either further right or further left than I was, but I wanted to make sure they had an experience. And I'm sorry to say that we only had time for one more question, so right here in the back. Hello there, my name is Ella Storms. I'm a first year undergrad here at UChicago. Um, and regardless of the extent to which this is even realistic, I'm really curious to hear your perspectives on nationally using um, an electoral, or not an electoral college, a um, direct popular vote or a ranked choice vote. You're talking about for the presidential race, whether it's just be nationally in general, yes, specifically vote. presidential races, but yeah, as a I mean, I, you know, our, our, our system right now, which is the electoral college system, where you have to go state by state, does allow states, you know, to get some attention that wouldn't otherwise get it. So if you have a national vote, um, Ohio probably would do okay. People probably still come to Ohio, but they spend a lot of time in California <laughs> and a lot of time in New York, and you wouldn't see many people showing up in New Hampshire, um, or for that matter. Uh, where's the Wisconsin Badger here? Wisconsin, you know. Yes. I mean, All so right. a lot of you, excellent. It's a. It was a system meant, I think, to fit within our federal system of government, where the states, you know, not only have some authority and power, but also, um, you know, have the have sort of the right to be to be considered as you're going through it. You got to win state by state. It's one reason that uh, when Joe looked at running as an independent, or other people have, like No Labels and others, it's hard because you got to win states. You know, even if you think you can do well nationally, you've got to actually win state by state. So there's a certain advantage to that. I've always thought that would work better than one national vote. Um, and what was your second question about, about primary system? Rank choice. Rank choice. Yeah, That's rank choice we, 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 we talked about earlier. Rank choice is so hard to explain that it would take us another hour to go through this system. <laughs> But um, I like to call it, you know, majority vote because you end up, there's different systems, but let's say you Maine have, has one, Alaska has one, yeah. Um, Maine has one, Alaska has one. And you have, let's say, four or five finishers first. Then you have, a, you have to rank them first, second, third, fourth, fifth, whatever. And then this next time around, if your first place person drops out, you have the second place person. So what happens is the more hardcore Republican, hardcore Democrats tend to drop out and you end up with the more the second or even third choice winning. That's how Lisa Murkowski won in, in Alaska. Yeah. I, I, I think it makes some sense, but it's as, hard to explain to people. As you jump in, I just want to say we have a minute left here. Leave these students with an optimistic note. I mean, we talk about a lot of the bad things in Washington. Yeah. Are you hopeful about, or, or have we gone to the bottom and we're going to go back up? Or are we at the bottom still? We're bouncing. You know, bouncing up and down, right? <laughs> <laughs> we're bouncing. We're going to make it. Let me tell you one thing. Winston Churchill once said, and this was during the, uh, the, the most dire time of, 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 of our friends in, in England uh, when he was getting bombarded and being bombed by the Nazis and fascism was taking over Europe and on and on and on. And he desperately wanted the United States to be involved because he had to have them for him to survive. And uh, his cabinet was coming after him and they, there's accounts of him saying, he says, oh, he said, please don't worry about the United States. He says, the people in America always do the right thing after they try everything else. Yeah. <laughs> well, 
We're trying everything. We've tried just about everything about to screw up a de democracy. We've tested it. We've bent it. We haven't broke it. We're bending it, and we're flexing it, and we're doing this and that. And I truly believe the checks and balances are still there. You are the checks and balances. You're the 60% of the checks and balances. And that's what, if you don't, now, if you don't care, then we're in trouble. If you don't want to get involved, we're in trouble. Do you want to last 40 seconds? You want okay, to wrap it up? So uh, Churchill also said democracy is the worst system of government except for all the others. <laughs> um, and, and he's right. So I'm on some positive stuff. Yeah. No, I'm, I'm, I'm ultimately hopeful. And why uh, I talked earlier about the fact that the political class seems to be uh, out of step with where most American people are. It's almost like there's a, that dichotomy now between this pushing out to the outside, almost like centrifugal forces we talked about earlier, the media, the money, the primary system, and where most Americans are, which is in their families, in their businesses, just like in, in yours, you figure out how to come up with solutions, right? You have to. And ultimately, I think that's where, where we end up. We may have to go through another several years here of this kind of polarization and pulling apart, but ultimately, I have hope of the fact that the American people themselves are going to stand up, start to vote in primaries, whether it's you know, through majority voting or ranked choice or whatever, but start to vote, get involved, get engaged. You're here. You're self-selected, as I said earlier. Thank you for being here. And uh, you know, let's make our democracy. Yeah. Let me say well, one thing yeah. very quickly, if I can. I know the time's up. Yeah. Let, me, <laughs> let me say one thing very quickly about True if, Senator. If it hadn't mm -hmm. been, if it hadn't been, if it hadn't been that you've seen us here, you know we like each other and we're good friends. If all you knew that Rob Portman's a Republican, Joe Manchin's a Democrat, you would think we don't like each other and we don't get along. That would be the assumption you would have, right? There's more to this than there is of what you would think because that's what they want you to think. And they want you to pick a side. There's only one side, the American side. There's not a Democrat side or a Republican side. Those might be different ideologies and different ways of fixing something. But we're all on the same side. That's what you have to make sure. Right. And that's a good way to leave it. Thank you all for having us. Enjoyed the conversation. Thank you, Senators. Yep. I do. Yep. To close out the conference today, please welcome back to the stage IOP Director Heidi Heitkamp and our founder, David Axelrod. Wasn't that fabulous? Give them a big round of applause. They could be a lot of different places and they came here because they believe that this is the future. Um, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna first ask, start, I'm gonna um, start the closing comments the way I began the opening comments, which is to say the star of this show are the students. And so I want all the students who are still here who came to the University of Chicago to listen, who came to learn, stand up. Stand up. In, in the beginning, the first panel that we had, we heard a really important message, which is when, when Rhymefest was asked, how he dealt with prejudice, how he dealt with insensitive statements. What did he say? He said, I give grace. I don't assume motivation that I don't know exists. I reach out, I give grace. And today on the panel, you heard Whitney say, what is ours to do? And so I want to challenge every student here to think about what is yours to do. How do you take this experience today and think about your leadership? You're not just here to learn. You're here to build leadership skills. That's why you were selected by your university. That's why we selected you to come here. That's why we invested in you. Because we believe that you are part of the solution. You heard some suggestions. Not everything you heard here is going to be perfect or be able to be done correctly. And guess what we didn't tell you? You are going to fail. We were not very honest about that. When, when I have a friend, uh, Howard Buffett, who wrote a book about the work that he did in Africa, and it's called 40 Chances, and it's built on a speech that he once upon a time heard um, at a feed store about how many times a farmer is going to plant a crop. You have 40 chances to do it right. And he talks about the 40 chances that he had in Africa to build out conservation farming. And the book is really important, and I hope you all read it, because it's full of failure. 
I read the book expecting to be inspired by great ideas that would be successful, and every time I read a great idea, he would give the, the back story, which was a story of failure. Not a lot of people are willing to do that. And so I'm telling you that as you take what you've learned today and what you feel in your heart is your mission, be willing to accept risk. Be willing to fail. Be willing to try, because it is only through trying, it's only through advancing um, a new idea that you find out if things work. And you heard that from the panel today. And so I can't, um, I'm going to turn this over to David, um, because I don't know that I say this enough to him, which is thank you. Thank you for inviting me to be um, at the IOP. And thank you for creating an institution that does this kind of conference. Yeah, and, and if, if David hadn't had a component of the IOP called Bridging the Divide, I don't know that I would be here. And so this is my passion. You have shared this with me. I sat with enormous pride, and I'm going to thank some of our staff and, and uh, our sponsors after David offers a few words. But this is a moment for me, and so I just want to take a point of personal privilege to thank David for letting me be part yeah. of this institution you built, but also for all of you for inspiring me, especially the presenters. But I know that your hopefully launch, your ideas that you've been inspired to provide the leadership that's going to help us bridge the divide. I, uh... I am so I'm, short. I'm so pleased to hear you say that because it took me six months to persuade you to do this. So uh, I'm glad that it turned out the way I promised you it would. Um, look, I just want to say how proud I am of this place. Um, very, there are very few places where you can have the kinds of conversations that we've had the last few days here, and the whole mission of this institute—it's predicated on the notion that in this room there are people who can change the world. And I, every single conversation that I have here with students makes me feel more strongly that that is the case. And what we wanted to do was convene uh, meetings like this, uh, conferences like this, conversations like this, great conversations like the one we just heard modeling uh, civil discourse, and sometimes those conversations can get animated, uh, but we need to re approach them with a kind of sense of mutual uh, respect and, and in the quest for mutual understanding, and there's nowhere that that is more important than in this divide that has grown between rural and urban uh, areas in our country. So let's destroy, this is how we destroy the stereotypes and the caricatures and move forward. Uh, so I, I want to thank Heidi, I want to thank Zenat, I want to thank uh, Jen and Purvi and the entire staff for just this sensational job. I am like a proud father right now. I'm, it, we Jews call it kvelling. I am kvelling about what a great, uh, what, what a great place this is. And every time I, I've been traveling a lot, Every time I come back to the ILP, I feel like I've come home. And every time I sit with all of you, I feel uh, renewed and more hopeful. So I thank all of you as well for participating in this. Thank you. Well, David, David, um, uh, I want all the staff, I see you back there, Emma, I want all the staff to raise their hands. I want you to know that I want to call out particularly Pervy. Is she even in the room or is she busy bossing someone around? There you are. Yay! Pervy, who has been um, just absolutely amazing. And Benya, thank you. It, that, I, I, your panel this morning, your dialogue this morning was so significant and so moving. I, I, I can't tell you. I think, you know, yes, we bring a lot of intellectual property, but way too often we don't bring enough heart. And this morning we heard the heart.
and thank you. And thanks to all your Minnesota friends um, for coming. But um, we started this kind of on a, on a bet that people would be interested. We knew we could get students interested because that's what we do at the IOP. But you can't put this on without funders. And this is not a usual kind of thing. There is no one who has attempted to have a dialogue nationally at this level of urban-rural. And it took some faith on our investors' part to give us the resources to do this. And so I want to call out Allstate. Their foundation was a huge investor in this. I want to call out Christy Walton who um, I, I've known from other parts of my life, but um, uh, I, an impact investor who I hope uh, sees uh, that she, part, she, she helped uh, plant some uh, sparks of change here. And I want to call out the um, Democracy Initiative Fund that Ray Unangowski, Ray, sorry about your name. Um, Ray recently, he's an alum, and he recently put some money together for programs just like this, to convene a dialogue. He sees as somebody who's been successful in life, as somebody who can really make um, uh, uh, an entrepreneurial decision to make an investment in the kind of change. And I know sometimes it is, it is fashionable to criticize philanthropy. I hope that the panel this morning uh, took away some of that fear that you have of what philanthropy is doing but we would not have been able to do this conference without our funders. And so to them, thank you so much. Thank you for coming. Enjoy your time home. Oh, wait, now Dave has got to have the last word. This is the way it works. No, no, no. The reason I have to have the last word is because I was sitting there thinking, I, 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 I said, I made a joke about taking six months to persuade Heidi, <laughs> but there was a reason that I was so desperately interested in getting her here, and I think you just heard why, because she shares this passion that is so important to this mission, and uh, she was the one I knew when I handed off the leadership that she would carry that torch, so I, I would be remiss if I, if I didn't say well, that. So sorry to hold everybody up. Thank but, you. <laughs> yeah, travel safe. Thank you so much for coming to Chicago. I hope you have made lifelong friends. Um, travel safely home. Thank you so much.